we want to get started and talk a little bit about conservation action forums, which we've talked a little bit about today so far. Juliet mentioned them. Oh, I can't move. Nicole says, okay. Um, Okay, so um, I just want to talk a bit about our conservation action forums, and then we have um, representatives from each of the conservation neighborhoods that will share um, their highlights. So back in 2017, when we started to think about how to bring uh, KCP and our look of bringing East and West Kootenays together and our look at our region and started to look across our partnership, we realized that a lot of our partners work more at the local scale, have really great ties with their, their community members, really know their landscapes, their watersheds, and started to think about what's, what's a sort of an approach that we can take to bring that scale of information and on the ground stewardship into the Kootenai Connect, sorry, into the uh, KCP work that we do. And so the Conservation Action Forums were actually born in, a, in Silverton um, on the shores of uh, Slocan Lake. And in 2017, um, the process that we developed was to bring together broad perspectives, which is what we do at KCP, and identify key actions that contribute to enhancing and maintaining healthy fish and wildlife populations and ecological functions in conservation neighborhoods, so in the local landscapes, uh, over the next two to five years. And each of these conservation action forums brings together uh, relevant ecological knowledge and that scientific and local knowledge sets the stage for recommendations for actions, looking at values and threats analyses for that particular landscape, and priority setting that inform priority action plans and inspired collaborations. And what we found, um, we've now had seven, as Juliet said, of these various conservation action forums, and we've seen that there, there's these themes that they may be worded a bit differently, but they show up in all of the forums, which is to support recovery of species at risk and other target species of interest, to protect high quality habitats for biodiversity, to prevent and contain invasive species, to enhance and restore degraded ecosystems, enhance landscape connectivity and wildlife corridors, <coughs> reduce human wildlife conflict and recreational pressure, and to advance climate change resilience. So in these 14 neighborhoods, um, each, of the, each year we've, we've had a conservation action forum, in some cases two, but you can see here that the years are, are next to the different photos and you can see where we've been um, so far. And our first one, as I said, was in Silverton. We had one here in Preston in this very room in 2020, right before um, uh, sort of the COVID lockdown. We had it in January, which was great timing. Uh, we then have uh, two that we did in, on Zoom uh, in Golden and then the South Country. And um, in each of these, there's been sort of tailored con uh, conversations that um, we're going to go around the room and we're going to uh, visit each of these seven neighborhoods and we're going to hear from representatives about a priority action and a little bit of an update on them. But I wanted you just to see sort of the big picture of these 14 neighborhoods. So we're going to start off with the Slocan Lake watershed and um, Wendy if you could give an update. Um, I've asked each of the representatives to pick one of the priority actions and speak to a project. Within a minute and a half, just give us an update and um, we will go around. We'll start with Wendy. The priority action that I chose, and Decker's backing me up on this, Decker's also on our board, um, to, is to map the critical habitat for <clears throat> suites of species at risk. And one of the things when I first got, and actually it was the Action Forum in 2017 that I was first introduced to the internal workings of the stewardship. I'd always attended their AGMs and was always interested in conservation. But the Priority Action Forum was actually what kicked everything off for me. And one of the things that I observed with the stewardship was there was a lot of data information. We had a lot of research papers, various from organizations and sponsored by the society. 
And what I found is that we had no comprehensive way of relating that to a strategy or a plan for conservation um, that encompasses all that we want to do, which is protect, you know, um, enhance, you know, restore whatever we needed to do. So the critical uh, habitat really emerges very well with the BBC and uh, complementing all these actions, the BBC, Bonanza Biodiversity Corridor, came out very much as a top priority place. It is the highest concentration of wetlands in the Spokane watershed. It introduced tons of nutrients. There's alluvial fans reading into it, but we needed a way to relate it and we did it to the landscape level. So our critical habitats are mapped right up to the Alpine Ridge. It's a very precipitous place. There's over 40 tributaries in there and a very highly functioning watershed or basin. So that mapping I've leveraged since it was built, sort of and finished in the last year, but it's accumulation of over 10 years of research and effort. And we get to continually add to that as we discover new species. We were up in the Silverton Basin, which is another basin in the watershed, and we discovered a rare species, which we'll announce at some point. But um, those sort of things really keep adding to that value because more and more when you're setting your strategy and plans for conservation, you have to incorporate all perspectives and perspectives even how the government looks at things. And it's, we've mentioned this a couple of times, um, you can be species specific, but when we've got a range of habitats and environments, whether it's the um, cedar swamps or whether it's <laughs> up in the Alpine, all these environments all start to correlate and that's what's really helped us an awful lot. If you could pass to Rick, please, right there. Yeah. The thing about a conservation neighborhood is what it does, it ignites those people in the, in the community that are sort of waiting and want to do something. And it brings those together that really want to get going with something. And you get a plan out of it, and you'd be able to hold each other's feet to it and say, now we, we can go forward. And that's really what the conservation neighborhood does. That's it. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, I gave this talk to Wings Over the Rockies. It was on our turtle basking program. So uh, I'll just go through these notes real fast. So the Columbia Wetland Stewardship Problem Partners is involved in a program around species at risk and associated needs. The turtle project involved identifying turtles and associated habitat needs and deficiencies. The needs for basking logs in some areas of the turtle habitat was <coughs> identified. <coughs> Columbia Wetland Stewardship Partners asked the Lake Windermere District Road and Gun Club to manufacture and place basking logs in several ponds in 2021. <coughs> Uh, the objective was to identify material needs, identify how basking logs would be transported to and installed in ponds identified by the Columbia Wetlands Stewardship Partners. And of course, we had to assemble a team to carry out manufacturing installations. Remember the rotting gun club, everybody thinks of us as just hooks and bullets, but we're more than that. Um, so design and construction. So uh, we took upon research papers from other similar projects were reviewed to acquaint the team with materials, needs, methods used regarding the installation and concerns to be aware of. Uh, the club is quite resourceful, which allowed for utilizing contacts and member resourcefulness to obtain the manufacturing needs, things like telephone poles for logs, uh, ready rod, skitter chain welded together to make anchor bolts, uh, discarded cement blocks for anchors, and railway spikes for balancing logs. So the telephone poles were cut. These are telephone poles that are uh, taken down by hydro, and uh, we just said, well, let's recycle them. So, um, and that's what we've been doing. So the telephone poles were cut in eight foot to 12 foot lengths, angled on the ends so turtles could climb upon. And I have some pictures here, and I'll pass them around so you can sort of look at how this was all done. Um, so the installation was uh, lakes and ponds were chosen by the project coordinator and uh, Google Earth was used uh, prior to uh, the arrival to look at shoreline obstacles, boat access, best equipment, material delivery sites, and possible basking log sites. Uh, so if, if we needed to use a boat, then we had to know what type of motor to use or could we roll and that sort of thing. It's just not that simple. 
and um, on-site final preparation of logs are done and uh, chained, cut, and all this is done. You'll see that in the picture. Uh, logs are either driven to or towed by boat to installation sites. Uh, escape cover is important. So things like uh, when you install it, uh, one meter of water or less is what the, really the turtles are looking for. And um, logs are placed around ponds and lakes in the number requested by the project coordinator. So in the first year in 2021, we placed 20 basking logs out. Uh, half of them were like a shore log and half were a floating log to see how the turtles would respond to that. And in 2022, we placed 12 basking logs out that are just floating logs. That's it. Regret, I'll take the mic. Karen uh, Trivitz and Al Millette from the Trail Wildlife uh, Association are here today. So um, they wrote me a bit of a, a, an update that I'll read for you guys related to Action 5, which is strength in partnerships and effective communication with experts and land managers <coughs> in the region. So the Lower Columbia region has large swaths of land that are held by the Crown, Tech Metals and Lumber Companies with smaller tracts in provincial parks, private land conservancy and private holdings. Much of this land lies in the unceded territories of the Okanagan National Alliance, the Tanaha, the Sinaiks Nations. Each of these landowners has their own land and resource management plan and they're not necessarily aligned with each other. So, in 2018, with the Lower Columbia Conservation Action Forum, there was a huge role that was played in their region. And A, it got all the partners in the same room, and B, provided an opportunity to identify shared goals. Multiple new collaborative projects have been launched since that CAF. The most recent of these, in terms of landscape-level ecosystems projects, is the Lower Columbia Rare Species and Ecosystem Enhancement Project that's led by the Okanagan Nation Alliance. Trail Wildlife Association and Flynn Roard at the time, uh, now uh, Ministry of Forests, Fish Wildlife Compensation Program section. Karen and Al say that the forum also helped pave the way for collaborative management focus led by a newly formed Pond Array Working Group, um, which again is focused by, um, organized by the <coughs> Ministry of Forests, um, Fish Wildlife Compensation Program section. And this group has about 20 participants from across the land use sector, including agencies, First Nations, industry, and nonprofits. And this group is hosting field tours and is developing a process of data, data sharing in order to develop recommendations for best practices in the Lower Columbia region, especially to guide post-disturbance recovery actions. And now we'll go on to the Elk Valley, and we'll start with Chad. Okay. So, just talking about right barrier wetland habitat restoration at a landscape level. Um, about two years ago, we started talking to people about um, right barrier and floodplain areas, uh, particularly cobble forests, that are starting to see a lot more impacts because of uh, flooding, um, because of the, the clearing. Uh, we're starting to see a lot more land disappearing down into the Pacific because of uh, excess uh, flooding scenarios. So we started to explore what we could do about that. Um, and we managed to get uh, enough funding to start restoration at two conservation sites, uh, Big Ranch um, up in the north of the valley and the Morrissey Meadows in the south. And we're starting to see more funding coming in for private land as well. So. We're starting, we're hopefully going to be putting in 20,000 uh, trees over the next few years, just in the conservation properties alone. And this should start to see um, mitigation on uh, erosion. We should start seeing improvements on fish habitat, um, particularly we're selecting up through trap, bull trap habitat, um, improving populations there. And hopefully that will also start improving connectivity and uh, habitat improvements for elk, uh, bears, and other terrestrial animals. So we'll start to see more um, movement along the, the river and uh, instead of uh, animals sort of pushing up upland into uh, habitated areas and that should hopefully end up uh, resulting in I just lost my train of thought there anyway that's um, it's finally actually happening so yeah we're, we're starting to see more landscape level rather than just sort of small site specific restoration efforts which is the overall goal of that one 
Thanks, Chad. I, I, I'm going to take the fact that I have 30 seconds very seriously. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to speak to reducing human wildlife conflict and transportation corridors, which was one of the uh, objectives that was set. So we had science going back to a report published in 2010. There had been a lot of work done on, on this issue. And um, uh, the, the action forum was the catalyst to really get things moving. So in the last couple of years, uh, well, last three years, we've renewed the science, updated the science. Um, new underpasses were built in the last two years, four of them. Uh, at the, the eastern side of the, uh, um, the corridor, and right now uh, fencing is being built on, on 4.5 4 kilometers of fencing either side uh, from Alexander Creek to, uh, to Michelle Creek. That was 50 seconds, sorry. But what, the point that I really like, the, the, the point that I think is, re is really critical is it was at the forum that we had everybody together, highways was at the table, and at that point, we gained the champion who, at, in highways, who uh, who's really been a, a, an important part of making making this happen. So having that connection with government and him seeing the the unified uh, support for this kind of work at, at the forum, I think was a really, it was it was a critical juncture as far as this uh, this project uh, coming to pass. It's, we, we have literally years to go. Uh, 4.5 kilometers is a long way, but it's only a tiny part of our valley. Thanks, Randall. That was perfect. Okay, on to Mark Andre and Creston. If you could pass the mic to Mark Andre, please. So am I the only one to talk about your? Oh, no, oh. no. Uh, Richard's okay. going to chime in after you. Okay, good. Yep, you talk about the fire? Yeah. Right. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so our portion, I guess, of this uh, Creston calf is. Um, to announce the landscape connectivity and corridors through the well, through climate change lands. So basically, uh, our project is focused a lot on the recovery of the northern Latin frog and improving the corridor at the south um, south end of Duck Lake. And um, so I won't talk very long about it because tomorrow the field trip we're going there, so I'll do a better job at out in the field than I can here. But uh, basically, what we've done is we work closely with the um, NCC too because you know, the frog bear property and all the properties they have adjacent to this area. But um, we have uh, improved the hydrology a little bit in uh, the duck lake nesting area where we were having some issues just from probably uh, encroachment over time. The unit has been there from, uh, since 1968 and uh, lots of <laughs> cattail and encroachment. And so anyway, we did some dredging and um, in 2019 and um, improved like some of the migrating corridor. A lot of the science we've used is coming from the Northern Leopard Frog Recovery Program. It's been funded by the Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program for 25 years. <laughs> um, the the recovery team started in 2001, but they had funded they had funded four years of it before that. Um, so there's a long history, and then also Michael Proctor with all his research on, research on the grizzly bears in that area. And anyway, in 2020, we replaced the water control that provides that helps us provide the water to the to the nesting area where the frogs are, and um, that also kind of allows us to, I suppose, like in the, the climate change. That's where the climate change lands come in. Is um, will provide will help us like provide water to that area when we need it. You know, in times where it might be dry, we have a channel there just nearby the old river channel. And that usually has water, and um, so we can add water when the unit goes down too much. Um, and then uh, last year with NCC, we um, restored or created some wetlands on lot three there, and, and uh, also modified some existing uh, drainage or irrigation channel uh, to try to make it a bit more wildlife friendly. This year, we're planning on doing a bit more, and um, also um, we just finished fencing an area. Um, uh, an area where we, uh, we call West Meadows Farm uh, to try to establish um, a more vegetated corridor um, for wildlife so that we connect basically the East Channel of the Cuny River to the Purcell Mountain, you know, on the west, on the east side of the valley. And um, so the plan is like to revegetate re uh, that corridor and it'll also help a lot of other species. Um, Corey Lawson, I don't see that. These guys must have yeah, escaped somewhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Taking advantage of the hotel. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> yeah, of course, done a lot of work on bats here in the valley. We have a big bat condo too uh, on the West Meadows farm there, and um, so anyway, it'll be a good corridor for bats, so I'll leave it at that. Okay, please pass on to Richard. So a lot of this work was uh, started in the last couple of years since the uh, Crest in Action Forum by Adrian that's sick, not COVID related. Um, and so at that time, uh, we had the property with Frog Bear, was, one of them was Midgley, which is 160 acres. Uh, just west of the, up the slope of the Creston Valley Wildlife Management Area. And, you know, we knew that there was a lot of dry ICH forest on there that was dense and ingrown. And so Adrian, after the, King, the Crested Action Forum, said we should uh, maybe do some restoration there. So he started a prescription for some you know, stand thinning. And then the following year, we had the big Cultus Creek wildfire. And it came marching towards Creston. And so um, Adrian said, you know, the BC Wildfire Service, they were talking about trigger points and it's like, well, how many trigger points is it going to go by before it's marching down on Creston? So we took the initiative to clear a 50 meter wide uh, fire guard uh, that ties into the Midgley Mountain Fire from 2016 down to the edge of the, the Creston Valley Wildlife Management Area. And so since then, um, you know, and then the fire, it stopped uh, several kilometers away, which was great. But since then, we hired a, a forester to do uh, a landscape unit, uh, there's six large landscape units uh, in that Midgley area surrounding this fire guard. And what we've done is um, slowly start picking away at um, harvesting and thinning the, the stand. There's a lot of dead dying cedar in it from previous harvesting of uh, the big grand firs and then they left the cedar and got exposed to the sun and they're all sort of dying. So it was a good way to basically now we're thinning on either side of the fire guard to kind of create this more fire maintained system leaving behind the, the ponderosa pines, the western larch and Douglas fir that would do better in a fire and if a fire swept through there the, the BC wildfire service would have a better handle on being able to action the fire and so that we're do, going to do one more unit this year 15 hectares and then also uh, we put out an RFQ for the actual slashing and thinning on Midgley that's going to be upcoming and um, I think it's going to be about 20 to 30 hectares so small but we're slowly chipping away at trying to get some sort of semblance of what a dry ICH ecosystem would look like there. Awesome, thank you Richard. So we don't have anyone uh, representing Golden here, uh, so I'm going to read from what Rachel Darville uh, prepared for us. And uh, this was one of our virtual uh, conservation action forums. And as I was looking up at the screen, I forgot to sort of prompt you guys to understand when it, when it says uh, 16 sub-actions, 100%, what that means is that in the Golden Conservation Action Forum, we came up with five mini action plans. And so uh, within those action plans, there are 16 sub-actions, meaning that there's you know, various partners working on various aspects to achieve these uh, the goals of the, the five different um, plans. And 100% means that all five of these are being worked on. So um, good standing here for, for the Golden folks. So this is what Rachel writes, and she's writing on behalf of the Upper Columbia Swallow Enhancement Project. In 2021 and in 2022, the Upper Columbia Swallow Enhancement Project worked with 69 volunteers to learn more about and enhance habitat for barn and bank swallows. Both of these swallow species are listed as threatened under SARA, creating larger and more numerous opportunities for breeding areas that um, for these colonies of barn and bank swallows can allow us uh, to increase overall bird abundance and connectivity between sites in the Columbia Valley. Specifically, the Enhancement Project built five large 12 by 18 feet uh, artificial nesting structures for barn swallows in the Columbia Valley and have installed 40 nest cups. Structures were erect erected to increase habitat availability where current nesting structures are, being, uh, are going to be destroyed in the future and in areas where barn swallows already breed. This project is collaborating with the BC Bat Pro Program to build a structure that meets habitat requirements for both bats and barn swallows. The Swallow Project also restored bank swallow habitat in the Windermere Lake Provincial Park. And in addition, uh, the Swallow Project has been collaborating with Environment and Climate Change Canada's Canadian Wildlife Service and BC Parks to install three large and one small uh, MODIS wildlife tracking stations in the Columbia Valley and they've banded 50 bank swallows and put MODIS tags on each of them and they plan to do another 50 uh, next year in 2023 
And these modus tracking um, devices will be used to identify areas visited during the breeding and post-breeding um, migration of bank swallows. And the information uh, will be important for learning what areas are, are uh, key to conserve, enhance, or restore for bank swallows locally and at other breeding locations across Canada. And these stations uh, will join a network of MODIS receiving stations located throughout the Western Hemisphere, so tagged individuals will be tracked during fall migration, providing unprecedented information on migratory timing, routes, stopover locations, and winter areas. So that's Golden uh, speaking to, uh, to number one. So now we'll go to the South Country, and Randy, I'll, uh, I'll ask you to please record on behalf of you and the Yucca Octoclades. This is South Country response. We only have uh, three action plans, and we thought we'd actually uh, focus on the corridors. And yeah, there's a little getting some traction going. We're only about a, we only had our meeting this spring, so we haven't had a lot of action. There's about four or five thing planning actions planned. And they will um, probably come to fruition. I hear that one of them is going to come to fruition on October the third. Yeah, but you'll find out about that in the newspapers. It's going to be cleared up key biodiversity area. Cool. Um, so uh, what we actually have here is: that, is there anything actually going on right now? So I actually asked Myra Eukers, who couldn't be here today, and so she gave me something to read out. <coughs> and uh, it's the Yakut Eknuklia and um, several government ministries because they just reformed this spring. So we started up, they started working off of the Ministry of Forest Labs, Natural Resource Operations, Rural Development. The name is too long, but obviously they have to split into smaller ministries. <laughs> 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 and what they're actually working on is the Red Canyon Ungulate Enhancement Project. And uh, what happened is <coughs> there's several projects that have worked, that have been done there in the past. BC Timber Sales had actually done some, some uh, harvesting at the foot of the hill. They go farther up. There's been also some burning done back in the 1900s by the Ministry of Environment, and now they're working on with the Ministry of Lands, Air, and Natural Resource Stewardship, also known as land wars. Um, so when we say government ministries, uh, yes, the government is involved in some portion for it. Um, and what they're actually working with this one here is that on this particular hillside, fire suppression has led to forest encroachment. And it's an uh, important open forest habitat. And that's on the Galton Range, it's on the east side of the valley. <coughs> and uh, you have a lot of ungulate species here, particularly bighorn sheep, uh, Rocky Mountain elk, mule deer, and white tailed deer. So basically, all four. Um, and what this is focusing on developing and implementing harvesting and slashing prescriptions to move the dense immature conifer stands to open the canopy, improve sight lines, particularly important for bighorn sheep, and uh, improve understory conditions for ungulates, grass, and a lot of mule deer actually reported sand hills. Um, currently, a standard prescription is in development for this project area, and its implementation will be funded supported by funds from conservation, the Habitat Conservation Trust Fund, and possibly other funds as well. Um, Angular enhancement has been previously conducted by the ministry. We've also had prescribed burning done by, yeah, Flynn mm -hmm. Ward, uh, back in the days of Donald and uh, Raymond Creeks in these areas just to keep uh, winter ranges open. And um, it's a com combination of habitat enhancement office, habitat enhancement offer efforts. Uh, so for the overall goal of improving habitat quality for ungulates, particularly big corn sheep throughout the Galton Range. And we've got two or three other things focused on the Galton range, but so far it's just seed money and um, preliminary plans. So, Perfect. Okay. Thanks, so next up, um, calf number eight is going to be uh, focused on the South Selkirks um, moving uh, through the Salmo watershed to the lower Columbia Pond Ray area. Uh, we you know, if you go back to um, thinking about this map of the 14 uh, neighborhoods, um, sometimes our landscapes are a little sparse. So in looking at uh, the South Selkirk's um, Salmo area, it became um, really obvious as we were talking to people that there's there's good connection across there or along the trans border uh, with, with the U.S. And, and just so much connectivity there. So with this forum, um, we're going to revisit some of the priority actions and ideas that were generated in the Lower Columbia 
uh, Conservation Action Forum now that several uh, enhancement projects have started and partnerships have formed there. Um, those folks are ready for action. And um, so November 7th in Trail is where we'll be in our next face-to-face -face CAF. For many of you I, who come to our Conservation Action Forums, many of you have been tapped into to give the espresso shot presentations. We rely on your science, your knowledge. Um, you've been willing to, to stand up and, and share and create the foundations for these. Um, many of you have come to, as participants, come to several of these. And this really is, I think, many think tanks for our partnership in the local landscapes. And when I look across all the reports that have been written and all the values and threats assessments and all the various actions, um, it's, it's just amazing how much we all have achieved together and how people are so willing to think well together and then look for collaboration in terms of working across goals and mandates and leveraging funding. And, um, a, lo a lot of that also comes with our funders looking at what comes out of these forums. Like Krista was saying, um, with CBT, we have a really, um, a really good relationship in, in terms of talking through how some of these priorities can translate into uh, future funding opportunities. So when we look across the seven conservation action forums in terms of stats, we've got um, over 200 participants that have uh, been in attendance. Um, we have 40 different priority action plans, and that's not including all the sub-actions, which are close to 100. And we have 97%, um, you know, either in progress or completed uh, actions, which is really high, and we hope to get to 100 at some point. And all of this really translates to healthier fish and wildlife, more resilient habitats, and more connected landscapes. And I think that's what gets us all around the table together. So. Thank you very much again for everybody who participates and will participate in the next ones we have. It really takes a village to pull these off. <laughs>